Welcome to Bible Stories, where we explore the profound and often mysterious messages within the Holy Scriptures. Today, we're diving into one of the most intense and thought-provoking chapters in the entire Bible Revelation 9. Often regarded as the scariest chapter in the Bible, Revelation 9 presents a vivid depiction of God's judgment and the terrifying events that will unfold during the end times. As we journey through this chapter together, we'll uncover the symbolic meanings behind the visions, the purpose of God's judgments, and what these events mean for us as believers today. Before we begin, I want to invite you to become part of our growing community by subscribing to our channel. By doing so, you'll ensure that you never miss out on any of our deep dives into biblical stories and teachings. If this video resonates with you, please leave a like, share your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to share this video with your church group, family, and friends. Let's spread the knowledge and inspiration that the Bible offers to as many people as possible. Together, we can strengthen our faith and understanding of God's Word. Revelation 9 is often regarded as one of the most terrifying chapters in the entire Bible. If you encounter anything resembling its description, it's best to stay indoors. Watch this video all the way through to learn about the most catastrophic event the world will ever see and the most frightening being described in Scripture. While the Old Testament contains 15 books of prophecy, the New Testament has only one prophetic book, Revelation. This book was written by the Apostle John, one of Jesus' closest disciples, while he was living in Ephesus. John, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, spent their final years in Ephesus, where they were eventually buried. Revelation was composed towards the end of the first century, during the reign of Emperor Domitian. During this time, Emperor Domitian demanded that all people burn incense to honor Caesar once a year on a day known as Lord's Day. Citizens were required to stand before an altar, raise their hands, and declare, Caesar is Lord. This posed a profound challenge for early Christians, whose faith dictated that only Jesus is Lord. To refuse to declare Caesar as Lord meant facing severe consequences, including persecution and death. The question became whether the early Christians would remain steadfast in their faith under such intense pressure. Even before Revelation was written, Christians were already facing martyrdom for their beliefs. This entire book serves as a guide for those who are willing to lay down their lives for their faith. The term martyr originally meant witness, but as persecution intensified, it came to mean someone who dies for their faith in Jesus. John's approach to writing Revelation was different from his gospel and letters. This is because revelation was delivered to him in a unique way. God the Father gave it to Jesus, who then passed it to an angel, and this angel relayed it to John, who wrote it down for all the churches. No other book in the Bible came about through such a complex process. As John recorded what he saw and heard, the visions were so overwhelming that the angel had to remind him eleven times to write everything down. During these visions, John was taken up to heaven, where he heard voices and choirs singing, and he meticulously documented everything. Revelation is an extraordinary book, vividly depicting the return of Jesus Christ to earth. This event is foretold 318 times throughout the Bible, making it the most frequently mentioned prophecy. The book of Revelation details the events that will occur before, during, and after the return of Christ. This is where the trumpets come into play. Revelation is full of symbolic imagery. It uses various symbols to help us grasp concepts that are otherwise difficult to understand. It's important to recognize that these symbols are meant to clarify, not confuse. 
However, some people find the symbols too complex and choose to overlook or misunderstand the message, which is a mistake. We can categorize these symbols into four main types. 1. Easily understandable symbols. These include the dragon or serpent, which represents the devil, the lake of fire, symbolizing hell, and the great white throne, where the Lord will judge. 2. Symbols explained within the text. For example, stars represent angels, lampstands symbolize churches, seals, trumpets and bowls represent disasters, and incense symbolizes prayers rising to heaven. 3. Symbols found elsewhere in the Bible. The tree of life, the rainbow, the morning star, the iron rod, and oppressive governments depicted as wild beasts are examples. These symbols typically retain their meanings from the Old Testament. 4. Unclear symbols. Some symbols, like the white stone, are open to interpretation. Scholars debate whether it represents innocence, approval, or greatness. Its true meaning may only be revealed when one receives such a stone. Numbers also play a symbolic role in Revelation, with the number seven appearing frequently. Consider the seven stars, lampstands, lamps, seals, trumpets, and bowls. Specifically, the seven trumpets are mentioned in Revelation 8, 6, 9, 19, and 11, 15 to 19. These seven trumpets emerge from the seventh seal's judgment, meaning that when the seventh seal is opened, it summons angels who will blow these trumpets. Revelation 8, 1, 5. The events announced by these trumpets will occur during the tribulation in the last days. First trumpet. When the first angel blows the trumpet, the earth is struck by hail mixed with blood. Revelation 8, 7. A third of the earth's trees are destroyed, and all the green grass is burned. This devastating event is somewhat reminiscent of the seventh plague in Egypt. Second trumpet. A second angel blows the trumpet, and something resembling a giant burning mountain is hurled into the sea. Revelation 8.8 8. A third of the sea turns to blood, a third of the ships are destroyed, and a third of the sea creatures perish. This disaster has parallels with the first plague in Egypt. Third trumpet. The third trumpet judgment is similar to the second, but this time it affects the earth's fresh water lakes and rivers rather than the seas. Fourth trumpet. The fourth trumpet causes changes in the sky. A third of the sun, moon, and stars are struck, plunging a portion of the day and night into darkness. Following this, an angel or eagle flies through the sky, loudly warning, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Revelation 8.13 This is why the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are known as the three woes. Now we reach the first woe, which is described in Revelation 9.1.2. The fifth angel blows the trumpet, and John sees a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. This star was given the key to the bottomless pit. Before this, there were seven seals, followed by seven trumpets grouped together, though not necessarily occurring sequentially. The first four seals and trumpets dealt with catastrophic events on earth. The four horsemen brought dictatorship, war, famine, and death while the first four trumpets caused damage to plants, oceans, rivers, and the sky. The last three seals focused on heavenly events, such as the cries of martyrs, strange occurrences in the sky, and the introduction of the seven trumpets. The last three trumpets will describe horrors involving demons. In Revelation 9-1, we read about a fallen star, which represents a person referred to as he, not an actual star. The term fallen indicates that this being had already fallen before. T. There is speculation about who this star might be. 
Some believe it could be Nero, a fallen angel, an evil spirit, Satan, the word of God, a good angel, or even Jesus. However, the star is most likely an angel, and whether this angel is good or evil depends on its connection to the angel of the bottomless pit described in Revelation 9.11. If the angel in Revelation 9-1 is the same as in Revelation 9-11, then it is likely an evil angel, possibly Satan. If it is a different angel, it could be a good angel sent by God to unlock the pit and bring judgment. The fact that the star had fallen suggests it may be Satan or another high-ranking evil angel. However, the notion that this star was given the key to the bottomless pit complicates the idea that it is Satan. The Bible does not support the concept of Satan ruling hell. Instead, Satan is destined to be a prisoner in hell, not its master. At the same time, we see that the key is given to this being at a specific moment and for a specific purpose that aligns with God's plan. Whether this angel is evil or good, it ultimately serves God's design, even if unintentionally. The location of the bottomless pit is often debated. The simplest explanation is that it could be at the Earth's center, where everything seems to be on top and nothing is below. However, some scholars suggest that the idea of a bottomless pit is symbolic. The abyss is a prison for certain demons and is likely the same as the bottomless pit. In a broader sense, this place is seen as the realm of the dead, similar to Hades. Romans 10.7 asks, Who will descend into the abyss, meaning to bring Christ back from the dead? When the bottomless pit is opened, smoke rises like that from a great furnace, darkening the sun and the air. From this, smoke emerge locusts, given the power to torment those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. These locusts are not ordinary insects. Instead of eating plants, they sting people like scorpions. They represent a vast number of demons released upon the earth. Their torment will be so severe that people will seek death, but will not be able to find it. Revelation 9.2.6 this is not a literal plague of locusts, but a symbolic representation of the demonic forces unleashed during the Great Tribulation. God's impending judgment is a terrifying and inevitable reality, and as part of this judgment, He will unleash legions of demons that have been confined until now. These demonic forces will descend upon the earth like a swarm of devastating locusts, bringing chaos and destruction. However, those who bear the mark of God on their foreheads, the 144,000 mentioned in the book of Revelation, and possibly others, will be spared from this torment. But for the rest of humanity, there will be no escape from this judgment. The question arises, who are these 144,000 individuals mentioned in Revelation? Are they already among us? Could you or I be counted among them? The book of Revelation references this group three times, with Revelation 7-4 stating, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. These individuals are sealed by God to be protected from the severe judgments that are to come. Jesus himself spoke of this time, describing it as a period of great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. The term sealed in the New Testament originates from a Greek word that means to mark with a seal. This seal is a sign of God's protection and His specific plan for these individuals during the end times. Revelation 9.21 tells us that during this period, people will desperately seek death, but death will elude them. The torment they experience will be so intense that they will long for an end to their suffering, but it will not come. 
These demonic beings are described as having the strength of scorpions. While a scorpion's sting is excruciatingly painful, it typically does not result in death. In this case, however, the suffering inflicted by these demonic forces will be so severe that people will wish for death, but instead they will face eternal punishment. A fate vastly different from the Apostle Paul's longing for death, which he viewed as a gateway to eternal blessings. Revelation 9, 7-10 provides a vivid description of these demonic locusts. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what appeared to be crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like iron and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots rushing into battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings in their tails, their power to hurt people for five months. People have often speculated whether this description could correspond to natural locusts, albeit in a poetic sense, but such interpretations overlook the clear signs of their demonic nature. The reason God refers to them as locusts, despite them being evil spirits, is symbolic. They bring devastation much like natural locusts do. In the Old Testament, locusts are frequently messengers of God's judgment, as seen in stories like the plagues of Egypt, Exodus 10, 4-14, and in the book of Amos, Amos 4.9. The repeated use of the word like in the description, like horses, like gold, like human faces, like women's hair, like lion's teeth, suggests that these images should not be taken literally. The overall impression is one of eerie, terrifying strangeness. Some have theorized that these locusts might symbolize things like combat helicopters used by the Antichrist or a global government, but these are merely speculations that do not fit all the details given in the text. It's more likely that these locusts represent physical bodies created by God for these evil spirits, bodies that are appropriately horrifying for the demonic beings that inhabit them. As we approach the end times, it is clear that the world will face a period of unparalleled demonic suffering. While we cannot know the specific details of how this will unfold until it actually happens, what we do know is that evil forces will be unleashed in a way never seen before in history. Leading this horde of demonic locusts is a being named Abaddon in Hebrew and Apollyon in Greek, both of which mean destroyer or tormentor. Abaddon is a powerful demon under Satan's command and is in charge of an abyss filled with locusts that will emerge in the last days. The use of different names in Hebrew and Greek underscores the universality of this being's destructive nature. While the Old Testament frequently refers to Abaddon as a place of destruction, Job 31.12, in Revelation it is personified as a powerful demonic entity. Revelation 9.11 states, They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon. This indicates that the forces of evil are not chaotic or disorganized. They have a structured hierarchy with Abaddon at the helm. In the book of Daniel, we also see references to high-ranking demons, such as the Prince of Persia, showing that these forces are part of an organized kingdom opposed to God's people. The release of Abaddon and his demonic army marks the beginning of the final phase of God's judgment on the world. Satan and his forces will be given temporary authority to torment those who have rejected Christ, as God purifies the earth in preparation for a new heaven and a new earth.
This judgment will be a prelude to the ultimate defeat of Satan and his demons. In some Old Testament translations, like the English Standard Version and the New American Standard Bible, the name Abaddon is retained, while in others, such as the New International Version and the King James Version, it is translated as destruction. John's use of both the Hebrew and Greek names in Revelation makes a profound spiritual and political statement, linking the demonic forces of the past with those of the end times. The seals, trumpets, and bowls of Revelation collectively form the great day of God's wrath, a series of judgments designed to punish the kingdom of the Antichrist and all evil. The figure of Abaddon, Apollyon, represents a real demon who will inflict real pain on humanity during God's final judgment. Abaddon is also associated with the realm of the dead in the Old Testament, regularly linked with death and the underworld, or Sheol, Hades. In Revelation, control of the abyss is temporarily given to this evil angel, who has been imprisoned along with other demonic spirits. John may be using the name Abaddon to emphasize the destructive nature of this being, while others suggest it might be intended to mock Apollo, the Greek god associated with plagues and represented by the symbol of the locust. In the goal of Abaddon and his demonic forces is to carry out the mission described in John 10.10, where Jesus warns, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. With the abyss opened, John sees Abaddon leading his locusts in a rampage of destruction, tormenting all those who do not bear the seal of God on their foreheads. The locusts' refusal to harm vegetation, grass, trees, or plants indicates that their focus is entirely on humans. This symbolic nature of the locusts is reinforced by their association with demonic activity in the Old Testament. The sound of their wings, described as a mighty army approaching, emphasizes the terror they bring. Their torment will last for five months, corresponding to the natural life cycle of locusts which attack during this period. This duration of suffering signifies that the torment will persist for a significant period, long enough to break even the strongest of wills. Ultimately, the agony inflicted by Abaddon's locusts will be so intense that people will desperately seek death, but it will remain beyond their reach. The Bible consistently affirms the existence of demons beings that rebel against God's authority and seek to lead people astray. However, they are still under God's ultimate control and are often used to fulfill His divine purposes. As believers, it is crucial to resist Satan and his forces, standing firm in the truth of God's word. This profound judgment serves as a stark reminder of the spiritual battle we are all a part of and the importance of being sealed by God, protected from the wrath that is to come. Scripture provides us with profound insights into the behavior of demons and their methods of influence. Having become aware of these malevolent forces at work, we are commanded to take a stand in Christ and resist them, whether these forces manifest in individuals, corporations, or social structures. Today, demons have been granted a certain degree of freedom over the earth, enabling them to attempt to pull humanity away from God. They do this by promoting sin, inducing temptations, and tormenting and frightening us. These demonic beings share certain characteristics. They are spiritual, immutable, and immortal. However, they are not omnipotent. Their power is limited by what God permits. Jesus Christ came to earth to set the oppressed free from the grip of demonic power. Although Satan is evil and powerful, he is not all-powerful. 
Even Abaddon, the Destroyer, does not have complete control over the demons of hell. In Revelation, we see that even the demonic locusts released from the abyss can only torture their victims. They are not permitted to kill them. This restraint highlights a key truth. Even at their most virulent, the forces of darkness cannot escape God's sovereign control. Revelation 9.12-15, Naesbi, describes the first woe as having passed, with two more woes yet to come. Then the sixth angel sounds his trumpet, and a voice is heard from the four horns of the golden altar before God. This voice commands the sixth angel to release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. These four angels, who had been prepared for a specific hour, day, month, and year, are released to kill a third of mankind. The release of these four angels marks a day of wrath, a day filled with agony and anguish, trouble and devastation, darkness and sadness. It is a day when the normal world collides with the spiritual realm in a dramatic and terrifying way leading to catastrophic consequences for humanity. The Euphrates River, a significant river in the Bible often associated with the origins of human civilization, takes on a new, ominous significance in Revelation. It becomes a symbol of life, boundaries, and now the location of one of the most pivotal events in the end times. The purpose of releasing these angels is to unleash great destruction, with a third of humanity destined to perish. But why would God allow such devastation? The identity of these four angels is debated. They may or may not be the same angels mentioned earlier in Revelation 7 to 1. Regardless, they have been prepared for this moment of judgment suggesting that they are likely evil angels, instruments of divine wrath, despite their malevolent nature. The demonic locusts earlier in Revelation brought torment, but these four angels bring death on a massive scale. They are only awakened at the precise moment when God deems it necessary, and their destructive power is confined to a specific portion of humanity. They fulfill God's will at the appointed time, executing His judgment with precision. The Bible often portrays God's judgments as opportunities for repentance and demonstrations of His power and justice. Revelation 9, 20, 21 highlights that despite the plagues, the remaining people did not repent of their sins. This suggests that the judgments serve as a final call to repentance, a warning of the consequences of turning away from God and the importance of seeking reconciliation with Him. Revelation 9, 16, 19, Nasby, describes the number of horsemen in this vision, 200 million strong. John recounts how he saw in the vision these horses and their riders, who wore breastplates the color of fire, hyacinth, and brimstone. The heads of the horses resembled lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone that proceeded from their mouths. The power of these horses lies in their mouths and their tails, which are like serpents with heads that cause harm. The question arises, should this number be taken literally or symbolically? It may be that this number represents an army so vast it is beyond human comprehension, an army greater than anything humanity has ever seen. The riders are depicted in terrifying ways, with breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue and sulfur yellow, and horses with lion-like heads that breathe out destruction. Some have speculated that this vision describes a human army equipped with advanced modern warfare technology, with John using the best language he had to describe something beyond his understanding. However, no human army of such magnitude has ever existed. 
Even at the height of World War II, the total number of soldiers on both sides was only around 70 million. In 1965, China claimed to have an army and militia of 200 million, but many doubt this claim. Even if such an army were assembled and advanced, it is difficult to imagine, though not impossible, that they could kill a third of humanity, possibly over two billion people. Therefore, it may be more accurate to view this as a literal army of 200 million demonic beings unleashed upon the earth to bring unprecedented destruction. Revelation 9.20-21, NASB, continues with a sobering observation. The rest of mankind, those who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of their evil deeds. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood idols that cannot see, hear, or walk. Despite the clear and powerful signs of God's judgment, they refused to turn from their murders, sorceries, immorality, and thefts. This passage reveals the stubbornness of human nature, how quickly people can return to their old ways even after a great disaster. It is shocking to see how little people are willing to change, even in the face of divine judgment. They continue to worship demons and idols as if nothing has happened. The list of transgressions, murder, sorcery, immorality and theft is a strong indictment of our modern world, which is rife with these very sins. Those who survive this judgment are not the recipients of mercy, but rather those who persist in their rebellion against God. The use of seals in official contexts, such as a Roman centurion sealing a document intended only for his superior, illustrates the significance of the seal of God in Revelation. If the seals were broken, it would be clear that the letter had been tampered with. Similarly, the seal of God in Revelation marks those who belong to him, those who are protected from the coming wrath. The book of Revelation, with its mysterious visions and messages, presents the seal of God as a special and significant mark. This seal is not a physical mark, but a spiritual emblem, signifying that God is protecting certain individuals who are his true followers. The seal of God is mentioned during tumultuous and threatening events, marking those who are truly connected to God and under His protection. The concept of sealing in Revelation has roots in ancient practices, but is imbued with deep spiritual significance. It goes beyond establishing authority and authenticity. It is about being recognized as belonging to God, especially in times of difficulty and adversity. This spiritual seal represents faith and divine protection in a chaotic and uncertain world, reminding us of the importance of remaining steadfast in our commitment to God. As we delve deeper into this topic, we gain a greater understanding of the spiritual battle that surrounds us and the need to align ourselves with God's will. The seal of God holds profound significance, representing God's promise of protection and His desire for our unwavering loyalty. It serves as a powerful reminder that even in the most challenging times, God has marked those who belong to Him and will keep them safe. This concept of sealing is further explored in Ephesians 1.13-14, where it is written that after hearing the word of truth, the gospel of salvation and believing in it, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit acts as a guarantee of our inheritance until we take full possession of it, all to the praise of God's glory. In this context, the seal symbolizes the Holy Spirit given to believers as a sign of their salvation and the promise of their eternal inheritance. In the book of Revelation, the idea of sealing is vividly illustrated. In Revelation 7, 2-3, it says, 
Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. This protective seal is placed on the foreheads of God's servants, marking them as his own. Revelation 14, 1 elaborates further, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads, signifying that these individuals belong to God in a unique and profound way. While we are not explicitly told what specific service these 144,000 are called to, we know they are sealed for a special and distinct purpose. However, the concept of being sealed is not exclusive to them. The account of the sealing of God's servants mentions that this task was entrusted to angels. Some angels were responsible for restraining Satan and his agents, while another angel was tasked with marking God's faithful servants with this seal on their foreheads, a mark that God easily recognizes. This seal sets them apart, ensuring their safety and protection during the most perilous times. Throughout history, many groups have claimed to be the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation. Understanding who these 144,000 are, as described in Revelation 7 and 14, can be derived from several key points. 1. The children of Israel, the 144,000, are described as descendants of the biblical patriarch Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. They are specifically identified as Israelites in Revelation 7, 4. 2. Tribal Affiliation Their tribal affiliation is specific and detailed, with each of the twelve tribes of Israel contributing 12,000 members, as listed in Revelation 7, 4, 8. And 3. Protection During God's wrath during the period of God's wrath, these individuals will be protected and will triumphantly meet Jesus on Mount Zion when he returns. Revelation 14, 1. 4. Celibacy. They are described as celibate, having not defiled themselves with women, which is seen as a symbol of their purity and dedication. Revelation 14, 4. 5. Beginning of a greater harvest. The 144,000 are viewed as the first fruits, representing the beginning of a greater harvest of souls. Revelation 14, 4. 6. Marked by integrity and faithfulness. They are characterized by their integrity and unwavering faithfulness to God. Revelation 14, 5. Given these descriptions, it is challenging to argue that the 144,000 are symbolic of the entire church. Rather, they appear to represent a specific group with a unique role during the end times. The act of sealing, as described in Revelation, signifies a divine mark of protection and ownership. This process symbolizes spiritual preservation during times of tribulation, with each of the twelve tribes contributing twelve thousand members, which symbolizes completeness in God's selection. The number 144,000 is rich in symbolism. In biblical numerology, the number 12 often represents divine authority, completeness and perfect governance. Multiplying 12 tribes by 12,000 members from each tribe suggests an expanded completeness. The sealing of the 144,000 is a sign of God's sovereignty and His ability to preserve His chosen ones amidst chaos and destruction. This concept offers comfort to believers, assuring them of God's protection and highlighting the importance of faithfulness. In contrast to the seal of God, Revelation also introduces the concept of the mark of the beast. These two marks highlight the stark difference between good and evil, between God's power and worldly power. The seal of God, mentioned in Revelation 7-2-3, represents divine protection and ownership. 
It is given to God's faithful followers, marking them as His in a spiritual sense rather than a physical one. This seal symbolizes a deep personal commitment to God and His teachings, indicating spiritual protection during times of judgment and signifying that the individual has been chosen by God, reflecting a life lived according to divine principles. On the other hand, the mark of the beast, as described in Revelation 13, 16 to 17, is a sign of loyalty to the beast, a malevolent figure opposed to God. This mark signifies a turning away from God and an allegiance to corrupt worldly powers. It is referred to as the mark of the beast because it is instituted by a man known as the beast. According to Revelation 16.2 and 19.20, this mark distinguishes those who worship the beast. Revelation 13.16-17, Amplified Bible, states, He also compels all, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on their right hand or their forehead, signifying loyalty to the beast. This mark will be necessary for participation in the economy, and those without it will be unable to buy or sell anything. Only those who bear this special number, visible on a part of the body like the hand or forehead, will be allowed to engage in trade. The number 666 is the encoded name of the dictator known as the Beast. While the idea of a physical mark required to buy or sell might seem far-fetched, it is not impossible given today's technological advancements. There are many ways this could be implemented, and such systems are constantly being proposed and tested. A mark on the right hand or forehead is a clear indication of allegiance. Satan is not a creative being. He can only imitate what God does. Therefore, it is not surprising that this mark is a satanic parody of something God does with his seal. Accepting the mark of the beast is akin to turning your back on God. It signifies that you are choosing to align with those forces that stand against God. It's not just a visible mark on your body. It represents a way of life that is in opposition to God's intentions. The contrast between the seal of God and the mark of the beast is stark. The seal of God represents divine authority and protection, while the mark of the beast symbolizes submission to corrupt worldly power. The seal of God is a spiritual mark that denotes faith and obedience to God, while the mark of the beast is often interpreted as a physical or visible sign of conformity to evil forces. The seal of God signifies eternal salvation and alignment with God's will, while the mark of the beast represents temporary gains at the cost of spiritual damnation. The purpose of the seal of God is to confirm that you have been chosen by God. The revelation of Jesus Christ was given to John by God to show his servants what must soon take place. This book is filled with mysteries about future events. But what does it mean to have the seal of God on your forehead? Just as God protected his people during the plagues in Egypt, he will also protect them during the judgments that are described in Revelation 7. Understanding what this means for the 144,000 is crucial, but it also has implications for all believers. God has placed his seal on you, and we must learn what it means to be sealed by God. God's seal provides three significant provisions for believers. 1. Inclusion. God's seal includes you as a believer in Christ. This means that you are considered part of Christ, and everything that belongs to Him also belongs to you. For example, because of your connection with Christ, His righteousness becomes your righteousness. And do identification. The seal identifies you as belonging to God, much like the 144,000 in Revelation. It serves as a witness to your faith and commitment to God. 3. 
protection. The seal offers protection during times of judgment. Just as the 144,000 are protected during the tribulation, the seal of God assures you of his protection in the last days. Revelation 7, 9-14, NASB, describes what happens after the 144,000 are sealed. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes, peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. This passage depicts a vision of a great multitude, far beyond counting, from every corner of the earth, standing before God's throne in worship. The sealing of the 144,000 and the gathering of this multitude underscore the inclusivity of God's plan for salvation and the ultimate victory of His people. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, proclaimed the multitude, their voices echoing in the heavenly realm. Surrounding the throne were all the angels, along with the elders and the four living creatures, who fell face down before the throne and worshipped God. They declared, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. In this profound moment, one of the elders turned to me and asked, These who are clothed in white robes, who are they, and where have they come from? Unsure, I responded, My Lord, you know. The elder then revealed, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This scene in Revelation captures the songs of both saints and angels, united in praise. The saints, having been saved from unfaithfulness and destruction, stand before the throne of God and the Lamb. Their posture, significant and reverent, reflects their awareness of being in God's special presence. In our own religious worship, we too should approach God with the understanding that we are in His holy presence, and we must come to Him through Christ, our Mediator. Without Christ, sinners would be unable to approach God's throne. The saints in this vision are dressed in white robes, symbolizing their justification, holiness, and victory. They hold palm branches in their hands, a sign of triumph and peace. These faithful servants of God, having fought the good fight of faith and completed their earthly journey, now stand gloriously before the throne, embodying the victory that awaits all who remain steadfast in their faith. Their voices ring out in praise, crying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. This proclamation can be seen as a hosanna, a cry for the success of God's work in the world, or a hallelujah, a praise for the great salvation He has provided. Both the Father and the Son are united in receiving these praises, the Father as the one who devised salvation, and the Son as the one who purchased it. As the saints praise, the angels join in, serving before the throne of God with utmost humility and respect. They fall face down before the Lord, their posture reflecting the highest reverence. These angels, who have never sinned and are always in God's presence, not only cover their faces, but also prostrate themselves before Him. This act of worship demonstrates that even the most exalted creatures in heaven approach God with deep humility. How much more, then, should we, as frail and insignificant creatures, approach God with a spirit of humility and reverence in all our prayers and worship? The angels' praises align perfectly with those of the saints, creating a harmonious chorus in heaven. They add their own Amen to the praise, affirming the glory of God. 
They declare blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. In doing so, they acknowledge the magnificent attributes of God, His wisdom, power and might, and affirm that these divine perfections are worthy of eternal praise and glorification. As we reflect on the worship happening in heaven, we are reminded to prepare our hearts for such worship, practicing it regularly and longing for the day when our praises will be perfected in the presence of God. But why is this heavenly scene so significant? The sealing or marking of believers carries profound purpose and urgency, especially as we see the end times approaching. Have you ever considered the deep meaning and importance behind your own sealing or marking? It's astonishing to think that something as simple as a mark or seal can hold so much spiritual significance. You have been marked, sealed by God Himself. This seal signifies that you are truly His, and the hope of heaven is yours. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, this seal equips you to be a witness for God throughout the world. This mission was the last instruction Jesus gave His followers before ascending to heaven, and it remains the most important task for us until He returns. Acts 1.8 Amplified Bible tells us, But you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses to tell people about me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. This verse highlights the transformative power of the Holy Spirit, enabling believers to fulfill their calling as witnesses of Christ. The 144,000 mentioned in Revelation are those who have survived the Great Tribulation. They are not simply faithful saints from past ages, nor are they members of today's church. Many groups have claimed that their members constitute the 144,000, but human claims should be weighed against what the Bible actually says. The church is currently sealed with the Holy Spirit. Paul described this in Ephesians 1.13, saying, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. This seal, promised by Christ, indicates that believers are possessed and protected by God. Paul further instructs in Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This reminds us that our seal marks us as belonging to God, and we should live in a way that pleases Him. Similarly, in 2 Corinthians 1.22, Paul speaks of Jesus Christ, who also put his seal on us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. This seal is like a security deposit, guaranteeing the fulfillment of God's promise of eternal life. Those guided by the Holy Spirit are marked as genuine Christians, children of God, and heirs of eternal life. Romans 8:14-16. Salvation is not limited to the 144,000. It is important to understand that salvation is available to individuals from all races and nations, not just the descendants of ancient Israel. However, the people of Israel still hold a special place in God's plan. Besides the 144,000, Revelation speaks of a countless multitude of righteous individuals who will stand before God, dressed in white robes. Revelation 7-9 describes this scene. After these things I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes, peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands. This multitude represents people from every corner of the earth, standing before Christ, the Lamb.
Revelation 3, 5 further promises, He who overcomes will be clothed in white garments, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. This great multitude will consist of people from all nations, tribes, peoples, and languages gathered before Christ in heaven.